the show, uh, I sat down with the Fox executives and we talked about what it was going to look like, how it was going to be structured. And uh, it was interesting because there were three things that I really wanted to do, none of which they thought would work very well in the genre of, of cable news. One of them was live studio audience. I said, I think that that will give it a different dynamic and I think I will enjoy it because I like sort of the feedback from an audience. And I think they said, well, that's really not sort of a news channel type thing. And uh, I said, I don't want to have panels of four or five people all talking at one time. I said, it drives me nuts. Uh, I can't distinguish who's saying what. And, and I'm not a combative person by nature. Now, if you back me in a corner, I'll scratch your eyes out. But, you know, it's not that I'm going to take you over there and do it. Uh, I'm not going to draw first blood. I'll put it that way. But my point is that I watch a lot of the, the, uh, the shows, and, and it's not that they aren't very, very successful. It's just uh, taste personal thing for me. I like to hear people finish their sentences. I want to know what they're thinking. And personally, uh, I'd much rather have a conversation with someone with whom I disagree than to have a conversation with someone with whom I totally agree. I don't get a whole lot of traction if I have a conversation with somebody who everything I say, they say, that's right, that's right, that's right. Uh, I, I guess being married 35 years, I've never had that in my marriage, and so why start now? <laughs> I like to have conversations with people I don't agree with because I want to listen to them. It's not what they, they, they believe. I know what they believe. I want to know why. For me, the why question is always the important one, not the what. I get the what. Tell me why. Where did you, in your life experience, come to the conclusion that you did, whether it's about nuclear disarmament, the environment, taxes, sanctity of life, doesn't matter what it is. Tell me what what was it that brought you to this conclusion? And if you carry your view to its logical conclusion, where does it take you? And so that was the second thing. The third thing I wanted to do was music. And I said, I'd like to have music on the show. And they said, we can't afford it. And I said, you got musicians in the building. They said, how do you know? I said, it's a creative environment. You have people here. I promise you, in, a, in an organization of this uh, size, I said, there are people all over the place that are musicians. And it never occurred to them that we wouldn't have to pay all the musicians. <laughs> And so I said, just give me a chance. And so I put the word out in the halls. And I said, I knew one guy, for example, that was a drummer. And I said, who else do you know in the building that plays? Because musicians tend to congregate together and skip work and talk music instead of working. And so I just looked for all the slackers and said, OK, I need to talk. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> so anyway, before long, I mean, I had people walking up to me all over the place said, you know, I, I play rhythm, I play lead, I play keys, I play drums. And we've got 20-something people now that are sort of the stable out of which we draw this house band called the Little Rockers. These are guys who are, they, they work lights on the ladders. They're camera operators. Some of them are writers. Some of them do graphics. Uh, not one of them is a professional musician. And the, the incredible experience that we all have had, me included, to play with Willie Nelson and Tanya Tucker and Ray Price and Leonard Skinner and I, I mean it's just been incredible. We have this mindset that when a company is recklessly mismanaged it's the taxpayers business to go in there and uh, and rescue them and to let small business just suck air and go down. I, I think it's absurd. That in, in Iowa he had outspent us 20 to 1 and he pretty much had bought the, f the final 500 feet of every television and radio tower in the state, been on the air nonstop for two years, uh, had hired virtually every political consultant. There was no way that, that I was supposed to win and he could possibly lose. Um, and I think it was a matter of that no matter how hard he tried, it ultimately was that people weren't buying the product. And I, I'm sure that that part of it wasn't something he enjoyed reading about and how much money they spent and what they got from it. But, but let me add one thing, because I think a lot of people think that there's this big personal thing with Mitt Romney. We're not close and probably I'm not on his Christmas card list or anything, but the reality is my problem with Mitt Romney was Mitt Romney just needed to be Mitt Romney. If he'd have been who he was rather than trying to out be who everybody else was, I think he could have possibly gotten the nomination. We might not have been able to, to have taken it from him. But for example, if it was the issue on immigration, he wanted to go further than Tom Dan Crato. If it was pro-life, then he was going to out, out be me. If it was security, he was going to show that really Giuliani wasn't nearly as strong on that as he was. And if it was military, he was going to be stronger than John McCain. And, and the point was no one, no one believed that. And if he had just said, look, 
Each of these guys have their own strengths. Here's my strength. I'm a business guy. I take companies. I turn them around. This is what I do. I may not be the strongest guy on guns because, I mean, that kind of thing sort of literally blew up in his face, and it did. You know, in New Hampshire, a guy asked him a question. He says, I'm a lifelong hunter. Well, then the next day, the press reports that he'd never had a hunting license, never owned a gun. He shot one once at a dude ranch, and other than that, he'd shot rats or, or rabbits, I think, at 17 with one of his cousins. And, you know, that just comes across as disingenuous. What he should have said was, look, I'm not a big hunter myself, but I really respect people who value the Second Amendment and for whom this is a very important part of their lives, whether for sport or for protection of their families. It's just not my thing. That's credibility. But when you try to say, I'm the biggest hunter in the room, it, it just, that's what was the problem. And if Mitt had been Mitt Romney and not wanting to be everyone else on steroids, whatever their strength was, it, it could have been different. But he didn't ask me for my advice, so I'm giving it to you, though, for free. <laughs> If he asks, I'm going to charge him a lot. <laughs> Governor, you, you're known to have some really very funny and famous quotes. Could you please comment on some of these quotes? Jesus was too smart to ever run for public office. <laughs> like so many of my famous quotes, that was a, a spontaneous, uh, you know, I would use a, a rather graphic term. I'll just say it was a, uh, an expulsion of uh, the mouth from the brain that happened simultaneously without any previous connection. A lot of the things that I say, some of which gets me in trouble, are spontaneous reactions. But um, I am who I am. I say the things that I say. Sometimes that, that gets me in trouble. But I think most times people would rather you to be who you are. And But that particular comment was one he was asked in a debate, you know, who did I think Jesus would vote for? I thought the question on its face was absurd, as I did a lot of the questions that I got in the debates. I thought many of them were ridiculous, silly, a waste of time, and should be beneath the level of a journalist. But.